Right, hopefully we are live. Um, I'm just going to confirm that we are before I get started. Uh, just for those of you who are able to see this at this point in time, uh, we have the email address from which we can send emails uh, with any questions. Um, just get confirmation right now, just before we go too much. Seems like we are, we're there. Um, so, we'll get started uh, in earnest because I am only going to spend about half an hour um, tonight. Um, for reason being, I did uh, an hour and a half video last year and all the science that was in that video last year is still relevant. So, please check that out. Uh, we will try to put a link in the comments uh, for you to get straight to it, but you can find it if you're on this channel, Folks the Canopy Revision. Uh, it will be there as well, the C1 uh, 2018 uh, video you are looking for, Chemistry 1, uh, is where you're going to find the bulk of information. As I did say though, you can uh, email this uh, email address, so contactscience at folksacademy.com. I have uh, Miss Walker behind the scenes uh, on email. She may well email back an answer if you email in a question, or if it's a good question, uh, relevant to everyone, she'll pass it on to me uh, and then we'll go through it. As I said, I'm hoping to spend about half an hour, but if we get lots and lots of questions coming, um, then um, I will extend it a little bit, we can't go too long, um, but as I say, do check out that Chemistry 1 video for more information uh, and, and the whole video, hour and a half long, goes through pretty much most things. So, chemistry exam tomorrow, 9 o'clock, which is tough because uh, you had your English today, um, so going to be tired from that, but you've got to do some revision tonight because that exam is first thing tomorrow morning, don't get a lot of time. We will be in early in the yellow chair area to go through some bits and pieces if you want. Uh, and this is hopefully going to have a great reaction for you in your exam tomorrow. So chemistry basics, I'm not going to spend too long because you should know a bit. Oh, and I should say that this video I'm going to try to focus on the fact that um, these are the things that didn't sort of come up in last year's paper but are in the specification. Um, so we'll, we'll go over some of those, I'll go over a few common things, things that come up quite a lot uh, and we'll work on it from there. Basics, uh, if you want this PowerPoint by the way, Miss Walker is also uh, putting up the PowerPoint so you can get that. It's very similar, I've stolen a lot of it from lots of it from last time. Uh, so if you downloaded the one from the previous stream, you'll have a lot of this information, but I have added some bits as well. Basic definitions, uh, element is a substance containing only one type of atom, whereas a compound is a substance containing two or more elements which are chemically joined together. That's quite important, they must be chemically joined. Um, and then a mixture is two or more elements or compounds uh, which are not chemically joined together. Sometimes they give you diagrams of these. Mixtures will contain different elements and compounds, but they'll be separate in the little box, whereas compound, it has to have the atoms joined. All the atoms have to be joined, and they have to be different atoms, otherwise it's an element. Basics of a reaction. We'll talk a lot about reactions, but you have reactants always on the left side, uh, of your arrow and products always on the right um, so that's how every reaction looks uh, so you may be asked to identify the reactants which will be over here or the products which will be over here leading on from mixtures something which is in the specification which uh, didn't come up last year so could this year but I can't guarantee anything it's just thinking about what hasn't come up before um, so what might come up different separation techniques you need to be aware of I'm not going to go into huge detail on them, uh, but you can see them up here. There are four you need to know in the main. You've got filtration, and uh, filtration is used when you have an insoluble, which means a solid that does not dissolve, an insoluble solid in a liquid. You can use filtration. You place a filter paper in a filter funnel, and you pour the solution through the filter paper. The residue is the solid that's left behind, and the filtrate is the liquid that comes out of the bottom. That's used for separating uh, an insoluble, so a solid that does not dissolve uh, from a liquid, an insoluble solid. So that's filtration, nice easy technique. I'm sure you've done it before and you remember it. Uh, then we've got distillation. Distillation is used to separate two liquids, and this relies on the liquids having different boiling points. So if you have two liquids with different boiling points, uh, you heat them up, uh, heat up the mixture, I should say, until you get to the boiling point of one of those liquids. 
let's say it's water, water has a boiling point of 100 degrees, so you could heat it up till it got to 100, the water would evaporate, um, it passes into this piece of apparatus which is called a condenser and condenses back into a liquid and the pure liquid drops into here and the liquid which had a boiling point of higher than 100 uh, stays in the flask here because you didn't get hot enough for that liquid to evaporate. So that separates two liquids, distillation. You then have crystallisation. This is a very basic diagram showing crystallisation here. Crystallisation relies on you uh, evaporating a solution. Sorry, I should start by saying this is used when you have a soluble solid, which means a solid that does dissolve from a liquid. So you have a liquid with a solid dissolved in it. Uh, to get those out, so that would be like salt uh, in water. To get that out, you heat it up in an evaporated dish or evaporated basin until half the liquid has evaporated usually, and then you leave it for the rest of the liquid to evaporate over time. That's crystallisation. The reason you heat it up till half the liquid's gone, so you allow the crystals to form. Uh, if you evaporate all the liquid, it's just called evaporation, and that will still separate a liquid um, from a dissolved solid, a soluble solid, but uh, it doesn't give you as nice crystals. And then last of all, this comes up mainly in C2, it's called chromatography. It's used for separating coloured substances, but a lot more detail is in the chemical analysis section in C2. But chromatography is a separation technique used to separate mixtures of coloured compounds usually. Uh, but it comes up more in C2, but it is one that can be talked about in C1 because it is used to separate a mixture. Okay, so four separation techniques, filtration, insoluble solid in a liquid, distillation, two liquids, uh, crystallisation, a dissolved or soluble solid in a liquid, and chromatography, uh, which is used to separate usually coloured compounds, food dyes. Basics of atoms. Uh, so atoms, I'm not going to spend long on this because it is the real basic information and there is more on it in the full video which you can tune into but you need to know your subatomic particles protons neutrons electrons you need to know their masses you need to know their charges you need to know where they are found the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the electrons in shells or orbitals around the outside um, one thing, I'm not sure if I said it in the original video, so I'll just say now, they do occasionally ask why are all atoms neutral, and they are neutral because they have the same number of protons as electrons. Each proton is plus one, each electron is negative one, so they cancel each other out. Um, maybe said it in the full video, it was a year ago, can't remember, but that's something they do occasionally ask about it as well. When an atom becomes an ion, it loses or gains electrons. Protons and neutrons can never move because they're in the nucleus in the centre. You can only lose or gain electrons. So, numbers, symbols in a periodic table. You will get a periodic table in your exam, uh, so you will have that. It's a requirement still uh, for you to have one to refer to, so there will be one available to you. You need to be able to use that, though, looking at the symbols of different elements to work out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in different atoms. Uh, and they can ask you different ones in this. This is an example I'm going to use. This is chlorine. There's a reason I've picked chlorine, even though in the periodic table you, you get in the exam, it won't appear exactly like this. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about this for now and it will lead on to the next bit as well. So chlorine, if we're looking at this one, is symbol Cl. In this it has a bottom number of 17 and a top number of 35. The bottom number, which is always the smallest, is called the atomic number. That's called the atomic number. And the top number, which is always the bigger of the two, is called the mass number. Okay, so this has an atomic number of 17 and a mass number of 35. The reason those are important is because we can find out some information from that. So, the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. So, for this atom, it is 17. It has 17 protons. The number of electrons is also equal to the atomic number. So, this will also have 17 electrons. And finally, you can find the number of neutrons by doing a quick little sum. 
because the mass number is actually the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So, to work out the number of neutrons, you do the mass number, subtract the atomic number. Again, I do talk about this in the main video, so if you're watching that, that, that as well, then you can skip over this bit if I've already gone through it. But it is sort of key information why I'm going through it today. This, again, I talk about in the main video, but they didn't do in the exam last year, so I'm just raising it again. An isotope. The definition of an isotope is an element with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Okay? If you change the number of protons, you actually change the element itself. So chlorine always has to have 17 protons. But the difference between these two, the mass number is different. But in an exam, it's not enough to just say the mass number is different. The mass number is different because they have a different number of neutrons. So we can work that out. If we do 35 minus 17, it tells us we have 18 neutrons in this chlorine atom. Whereas if we do 37 minus 17, it tells us we have 20 neutrons in this chlorine atom. Hence they are isotopes. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. They didn't do anything about isotopes last year, it may well come up, but there is a lot in the spec, they don't have to do it, so I might not. One bit as well leading on from that, I'm going to briefly talk about this, is the relative atomic masses that you find in the periodic table, the numbers, the mass numbers you find in the periodic table, if we use chlorine as an example, it is actually shown as 35.5. And the reason for that is, and you have to be able to do this, it's in the specification, but it hasn't come up before. It may come up again, but who knows. Um, it's an average value, which takes into account the relative abundance. That just means the amount of the different isotopes of an element. So chlorine, as we've just seen, has two isotopes. Chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. They're present in different amounts. So this is the amounts they are present in. Chlorine 37 is, makes up 25% of all chlorine atoms. So if you had a group of chlorine atoms, 100 chlorine atoms, 25 of them would have a mass of 37. Whereas uh, this number is actually wrong. That should be 75%, which is the other bit. I think I've copied over 35 there. But that should be 75%. Apologies for that. 75% of them have a mass of 35. That's what leads us to this sum. To work out the relative atomic mass. AR stands for the relative atomic mass. You do 75 divided by 100. The percentage divided by 100 times the mass, 35. Put it in brackets and add that to 25% divided by 100 times the 37. Put it in brackets. Do those sums separately. You get 26.25 and 9.25. Add the two together. Gives you 35.5. That is how it appears in a periodic table. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. So I'm not expecting you necessarily to be able to read it. In the previous video, um, I've made this, um, it's, it's actually a, a diagram that kind of summarises this information. I've, I've changed it to bullet points this time, just to give you another view on it. And a few things I'm going to go about, uh, talk about how the atom was developed. The model of the atom has been developed over time. Um, new evidence leads to changes in models, scientific models. And the atom is no different. So originally they believed an atom was the smallest particle of matter. I'm not going to go into the full story of that, I do in the other video, but they were solid balls, which everything was made of. Um, they discovered electrons, or at least negative particles, a good few years later, the substantial gap in time, um, and this guy, J.J. Thompson, changed the model of this solid ball, just one solid ball, which was like a billiard ball, or snooker ball, or pool ball. Um, he actually changed that. He said that the atom was actually a round ball of positive charge with dots of uh, negative particles, electrons, in that, in random positions. It's called the plum pudding model. Uh, it looked a bit like this, as I say, you see on the other video, but positive charge with little uh, specks of negative charge dotted around like it. 
A plum pudding is an old fashioned dessert. Uh, you could think of it like a chocolate chip cookie, something like that, where these are the chips in it, but it's actually 3D, it's a ball, a round ball. So that was the plum pudding model. That was because they found these negative particles. So they found electrons first. After that, a few years later, they did an experiment, or some, some people did an experiment, which was called the alpha particle scattering experiment. Now there are, you can go into a bit more detail on this, so I'm not going to go into too much now, but essentially they took a thin sheet of gold, one atom thick, and they fired particles called alpha particles at this sheet of gold. Now if, if atoms were solid balls like this, you would expect that those particles would hit that gold and just stop, wouldn't be able to go through it. But they actually saw that wasn't the case. They saw that these alpha particles passed straight through the sheet of gold and were detected on the other side by a detector. Some of them were actually deflected, bounced off at weird angles, but some of them passed directly through, straight through. That was unusual, they couldn't explain why, until this guy Rutherford came along and said, well, it's obvious, the atom must have a tiny positive centre to it, and the rest of it is nothing. Okay? The majority of an atom, actually like 99% of an atom, is empty space. Um, so the centre of the atom is a tiny positive charge, and he called that the nucleus, and the rest of it is empty. Now, he suggested the electrons took up that space. So he came up with a nuclear model, which looked like this. Had your nucleus in the centre, um, and then had rings of electrons around. But, I mean, for him, he didn't come into the idea of these uh, specific energy levels uh, of electrons until a bit later. That came when uh, Niels Bohr refined the model and said that these electrons were in specific energy levels at a certain distance from the nucleus. So that was Niels Bohr a bit later. So Rutherford found there was a nucleus in the centre, the rest of the atom was empty space, and Bohr said, yeah, that empty space is taken up by electrons which are in energy levels or shells around the nucleus. Later experiments found, and that sort of was the discovery of, because they found it was positive, discovery of protons, but they didn't know there were protons till a bit later. So they actually found that electrons are now in clouds around the nucleus, the protons are in the nucleus and positively charged, and the last subatomic particle to be discovered was the neutrons, which are also found in the nucleus and have a mass. That's how the model of the atom has been developed over time. Um, questions I've seen on this before rely on you comparing the plum pudding model to the nuclear model. Solid ball of positive charge, randomly placed negative electrons which cannot move. All the mass and positivity, positive charge in the centre of the atom, most of the atom empty space, electrons moving in fixed energy levels or shells. Comparison of the two. Um, Periodic table, how did they develop that? The periodic table we now know has been mainly created by this guy, Mendeleev. Um, he came up with the original idea, it looked like this, it's been refined a bit over time, but this is still the general setup of it. Uh, but before him, uh, mainly the person you need to know is Newland's Law of Octaves. Um, because they didn't know about subatomic particles, about protons and neutrons, uh, when they were deciding these structures for the periodic table, they ordered the uh, elements by atomic mass, just by how heavy they were. They put the lightest ones first and the heaviest ones at the end. Uh, so in order of atomic mass, Newland noticed that every eight elements, there seemed to be a pattern of similar properties. So he arranged them in eights, and he called them octaves, hence it's the law of octaves. Um, it wasn't accepted by other scientists because um, the patterns came apart after a while. So it worked for the first few elements, but after too many elements had been added um, to, the, to the pattern, it didn't work. So scientists said, well, that can't be the case. It's just fluky, it's just luck that it works uh, for the first few. Mendeleev did the same thing, put them in order of atomic mass. 
Uh, he saw patterns and put them in columns where the patterns were similar. Not necessarily in apes. What he did notice is he noticed that sometimes he had to swap elements around to make them fit the pattern when he put them in order of mass. And also he noticed that there were gaps in his table. He left spaces. Now again, scientists were sceptical about it at first. They didn't quite believe it was true. But then they started to find elements which fit in the gaps that he had left and he had accurately predicted the properties of some of those elements. So then they began to accept it. It's been refined since. They've added in the transition metals. They also didn't know about group zero, which was the noble gases, because the noble gases are very unreactive. And most of these elements they knew about because they reacted with other things. So they did not know the transition metals, which is that big block in the middle of the periodic table, and they didn't know anything about group zero because they were too unreactive. Talking about the periodic table, there's some specific groups you need to know about. They asked a bit about the halogens last time, um, which is group seven, and in the other video I do talk briefly about them. So I decided to talk a bit about group one because that didn't come up um, last time. They can ask about group zero as well, but there's not too much you need to know about group zero other than they are all gases, um, they're the noble gases, they're very unreactive because they have full outer shells. That's group zero. Group one, on the other hand, they are known as the alkali metals. They are very reactive metals. Um, and the reason they're very reactive is because they have one electron in their outer shell. We can also tell that because they're in group one. The group number tells us the number of electrons in the outer shell. Group one has one electron in its outer shell. You need to know three reactions of these. You need to know their reaction with water, which makes hydrogen gas and a metal hydroxide. I'll briefly draw it up. So uh, if you take an alkaline metal, I'm going to use the example of lithium uh, for all of these. So you use lithium. You add it to water. It will fizz, it will bubble, it will give off gas. It will move around on the surface of the water and it will eventually dissolve or disappear. That is because it's reacting to make lithium hydroxide and the bubbles that you see given off are hydrogen gas. So lithium plus water makes hydrogen and lithium hydroxide. As you go down the group they get more reactive. So lithium will fizz and move about slowly. Sodium will move about quicker, will bubble even more, and it will get so hot it will melt into a ball before it dissolves. And potassium will react so violently that it will fizz rapidly, melt, catch fire because it gets so hot, and it will burn with a lilac flame because potassium makes flames lilac in colour. Lilac's like a purple, light purple colour. So they get more reactive as you go down group one. Um, these are the three you need to know though. Don't worry about going further, but the pattern still continues. As you go down the group, group one become more reactive. Um, I will explain why in a second. I'll come back to that briefly using these electronic structures. But before that, they also react with oxygen to make uh, metal oxide. Very simple reaction. I'm going to use sodium uh, for my example here. So if you take sodium, you add it to oxygen. We have a very violent reaction, but will give you sodium oxide. So, very simple. Um, and then similarly, it will react with halogens. Group 7 like to react with group 1, um, for the very good reason that group 1 like to lose this electron in its outer shell. Group 7 want to gain one electron, so the two match together very nicely. Group 1 gives up its electron, outer electron, and group 7 takes that outer electron to form an ionic bond um, between the metal and the halogen. So the example I'll use for this, I'll use potassium down here. So if we take potassium and the halogen I'll pick uh, will be chlorine. You can pick any one in group 7. And that will make potassium... Chloride. 
Notice that the name of the metal stays the same. So potassium, sodium, lithium, whichever one you're using. And the name of the halogen changes for, from chlorine to chloride. If I'd use bromine, it would go bromide. Uh, fluorine, fluoride, iodine, iodide. Okay? So those are some reactions that come up with group one. I said I would come back to why they react in this way. So group one has one electron in its outer shell. For it to react, it wants to lose that electron. Electrons are attracted to the nucleus of the atom. The nucleus is positive, the electrons are negative. So, the further away you get from the nucleus, the weaker the attraction is. So it's weaker the further away. Now, because it wants to give that away, that makes it more reactive. So we talk about two things. We talk about distance. As the distance increases, it gets weaker, the attraction, so it's easier to lose that electron. And the other thing we talk about is shielding. The more shells they have, the more these electrons shield this outer electron from the nucleus. Now that's fairly brief. If you want to know more about it, look in the revision guide. But I'm going to move on just there. You can play this video back afterwards. Go through that again if you wish. But distance increases and shielding increases. That's why they get more reactive as you go down the group. The halogens, it's actually the opposite. They get more reactive as you go up the group. Exon endothermic. Uh, this only came up a little bit last year. A few questions. Reaction profile, one question about whether a reaction was endo or exothermic. It is a big topic, so I am surprised it didn't come up in more detail. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a big question uh, on this uh, this year. Uh, this is in the other video as well, but I'm going to go over it again because, as I said, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a fairly big question on it particularly on the required practical. But again, this is all guesswork, so do make sure you revise the whole content in C1. Anyway, exothermic reactions. Exothermic reactions give out energy. The way I think of that is they are exothermic. Exo, exit. That's where it is. So, exits. Heat exits the reaction. Leaves the reaction. Exothermic. That means the temperature goes up. Because they're giving out heat, it causes the temperature to rise. Because it actually heats up the surroundings by giving out that heat energy, causing the temperature of everything to go up. So exothermic reactions give out energy, they cause the temperature to go up. An example of this would be burning, or scientifically called combustion, reacting with oxygen. Um, that is a good example of an exothermic reaction. And uses of it, um, some of the ones that come up are self-heating cans. You can get cans that hold like coffee. Uh, you open them up, you press a button in the bottom, a chemical reaction happens and it warms the coffee. Uh, you can get those hand warmers that you uh, put something in your glove and crack it. The two chemicals mix and actually warms up your gloves. Uh, those are examples of exothermic reactions. But the key thing to look out for is the temperature will rise, it will go up if it's an exothermic reaction because heat is being given out. Endothermic reactions are the opposite. Endo means heat enters, so it takes in heat energy. This causes the temperature to go down. Because they're pulling energy in, heat energy in, it gets colder. So the temperature goes down. An example that they sometimes use for this is photosynthesis but also thermal decomposition. They did talk about that last year uh, because it takes in energy to break something down, thermal decomposition of a carbonate. That is another example of an endothermic reaction. Uses would be the cold injury packs. If you've been down, got one of those cold injury packs because you've twisted your ankle, uh, you break the bag, the two chemicals mix, they take in energy which causes the gel to cool down and then you can put it on the injury to reduce the swelling. This is the required practical. Um, it's how you investigate energy changes in reactions. Um, it's, it can be very basic, it can be quite technical, depending on how you do it. Types of experiments you could do with this, you could react a metal with an acid, um, you could do neutralization, acid plus alkaloid or acid plus base. You could do displacement, which is a specific reaction for, for reactive metals and for halogens that you need to look up. 
and you can react metals with carbonates. Um, all of these uh, are reactions. So let's be acid of carbonates would be the reaction there. Um, you can do all of these reactions to uh, see a change in temperature. Now, what you do is you mix your chemicals inside usually a polystyrene cup. You'd use a polystyrene cup. The um, reason you use a polystyrene cup is because that insulates it from the outside. Um, so you can see the temperature change in the liquid that's inside the polystyrene cup. You'd use a thermometer to measure the temperature at the start of the experiment. So you usually put one liquid into your uh, polystyrene cup, take the temperature and record it. You then add a second chemical to the cup and leave it till the reaction had finished. The temperature would rise or go down, depending on if it's ex or endothermic, and then take the final temperature that it reaches. You may need to stir it with a glass rod um, to get the chemicals to mix. You shouldn't stir with the thermometer because it can damage the thermometer. So you take the thermometer out, stir with a glass rod, place the thermometer back in, check the change in temperature. <coughs> um, the way you can alter this experiment is you can change the concentration of solutions. So if you reacted a metal with an acid, you could do it with dilute acid, 0.5 molar, uh, or you could do it with concentrated acid, 3 molar. Um, you could take the temperature change with each of the different concentrations, 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3. See if it makes a difference to the amount of energy that is released in the experiment, i.e. the change in temperature. You could do it with the different types of reactions. Again, metal and acids. You could use the same concentration of acid, keep that the same, let's say 1 molar acid, and you could add different metals to it. I'm going to try it with copper, with iron, with uh, aluminium, with magnesium, see if that makes a difference to the temperature change. Or I could do it with size of reactant. So again, this time if I was doing metal and acid, I would keep my metal the same, I'd keep my concentration of acid the same, and I would maybe cut the metal into smaller pieces. So try big lumps of metal, medium sized lumps, and small lumps. Whenever you're talking about um, experiments, write down all the equipment you can think of, and the last step, if you're writing a method, is always to repeat the experiment and then take a mean of your results and remove any anomalies. Good tip. The biggest way this experiment goes wrong is heat is lost to the surroundings. So this experiment, for example, does not have a lid on it. So when heat is given off, heat will escape from the top and it will be lost, meaning your temperature rise is actually smaller than it should be because heat has actually escaped. So if you want to make sure this is a good experiment, you'll put a lid on it. And you could also insulate the beaker more, maybe by wrapping it in cotton wool, something like that. Uh, if they haven't stirred uh, the reagents, maybe that's a reason why the results are wrong, because you need to stir it to ensure the chemicals are mixed. But the massive uh, error that's usually in this experiment is heat lost to the surroundings. In this one particularly, there is no lid on it. Right, we have hit the half an hour mark, so I'll put up this on energy profiles, reaction profiles. This did come up last year during this, but just remember, for an exothermic reaction, your products need to be lower than your reactants. This is the energy of the reactants, this is the products. There's always a hill to get over, which is the activation energy, the minimum amount of energy needed for reaction to occur. So it always goes up, then down. This is for an exothermic reaction. And this is for an endothermic reaction. Reactance there goes up the hill and ends up higher than it did before. And if you are sitting the higher paper, uh, this is a calculation question that didn't come up last year on bond energy calculations. You need to work out the amount of energy given off when the bonds are breaking, requires energy to be taken in. So when you break a bond, you need to take in energy to break it apart. And that means the sign of this is going to be positive. And then if you are making bonds, it gives out energy. So you put the bond together, you make energy, you make a negative sign. Making bonds gives out energy, and you have a negative sign for these bond energies. You will give numbers, it will give you numbers for the different energies in the different bonds. 
you need to work out how many there are. There are four CH bonds here, two OO double bonds. Okay, so look at the diagram if they give you one, or try to work it out from the equation if they're being really harsh. But this, I would just stress again, is in the higher paper, not the foundation paper. So I thought I'd put that up at the end. Okay. Lots of things I could have covered. Extracted metals didn't come up in much detail last year. Um, structure and properties comes up every year. So do revise tonight, look at the other video because I go into good detail on it. Ionic, covalent, and when I say covalent, I mean simple molecules and giant covalent, and then um, metallic structures as well. Do have a look at the bonding and the uh, properties of those three types of compounds because that comes up every single year, split into lots of different questions. It's a real key topic. Okay, so make sure you look at a bigger video for that. Um, I'll put the last slide up, otherwise I'm going to sign off there unless we've had some, some big questions. Um, just give a few shout outs because I was told to. Um, I believe Serge Corbs wanted me to call him that or something along those lines. My boy OB, that's Owen Brown, he told me I had to. Um, I'm just checking they watch to the end of the video really. Uh, Luke and Theo, the music too. And uh, Maisie said, said to say hi and Che said something like GG, big up, biology, mandate, which I have no idea what it means because I'm far too old. I'm checking you watch to the end of the video. You better come in tomorrow morning early and tell me that you saw that. Otherwise, thanks for watching.